My name is Ali. I'm a doctor and YouTuber. I'm Taymor. I'm a data scientist and writer. And you're listening to Not Overthinking, the weekly podcast where we think about happiness, creativity, and the human condition. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Not Overthinking. Taymor, how are you doing today? How am I doing today? Yeah, I think I'm doing broadly broadly all right. Broadly all right? Yeah. What does that mean? Yeah, you know. No, I don't. <laughs> Please do enlighten me. <laughs> yeah, a bit of this, a bit of that. <laughs> all right, a bit of comsi comsa. Yeah, comsi comsa kind of thing. How about you? You just got back from a little skiing holiday? Yeah, in uh, in France, actually. Hence the older comsi comsa. Oh, I've, been, uh, nice. I've been brushing up on my Italian. Um, no, it was good. I uh, was there for a week. Uh, we, le- we left last Saturday, arrived back today, which is Sunday, so eight days. Um, and yeah, in, in, in general, it was a very strong, low social optionality group trip with people that I broadly didn't know before oh, attending cool. the trip. Um, and when making the, the, the decision whether to go on this trip or not, the, the phrase low social, social optionality played a surprisingly large uh, amount of my decision making process. Nice. Are you now like friends with these people? I'd say so. Yeah, I was pretty good friends with one of them already. But then the others, I like the second, I sort of knew a little bit, but then I didn't know any of the others at all. And now I'd say that I'm reasonably good friends. Oh, probably not reasonably good friends and I probably won't invite most of them to my wedding but okay. you know would you guys hang out again do you think I think so but it, it, it would have to be so like for the for the people I already knew I'd, I'd definitely hang out with them so that was like one or two people yeah one or two people but then for the rest of the group I would definitely hang out with them if there was something organised that I were, I were invited to okay. or if I were organising something where I, f- I feel like they would fit in nicely but yeah. beyond that it would take a lot for us to actually get together again I think I see did you feel particularly drawn to any anyone in particular in the group like was there anyone who kind of stood out to you as like oh like i already get on with this person or like i feel some kind of affinity with this person um i'd say yeah there were a couple of people in the group who who just had a very warm sort of vibe okay um and that was very appealing um especially because like as a stranger like essentially a stranger in this group like they all knew each other really well and i was like the odd one out Uh. so when there were a couple of people in this group who were just like like very actively warm towards like everyone in the group yeah but you know that was an example of the warmth like what what might they have done or said that you wouldn't have done or said as a non-warm person (laughs) hey i'm a pretty warm person I think they were making an active effort to include me in like the thing, okay. which I didn't really need because I was I was I was fairly comfortable in the group anyway, and, and it was fine. Yeah. Uh, but for example, if I'd uh, you know on, on like a ski trip, you'll kind of ski down one at a time, and you can yeah. wait for each other at certain stops. Yeah. Um, and like if one of them would be waiting at the stop, and I would kind of go up next, they would make it a point to ask something about, oh, you know, that looked really good down there, or you know, how are you finding the day, or you know, yeah, just yeah, like yeah. general small talky things like that. Yeah. Um, which really added a a, a whole like um, you know warm warmness to the whole interaction I thought yeah Yeah. oh that's cool yeah so now I I mean so I was like every time I'd be asked one of these questions I would I would sort of think in the back of my mind that the fact that you've asked this makes me feel really good but it's 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 just not the sort of thing I would I would routinely ask (laughs) because it feels too small talky in a way and I think I've got too much of a bias towards trying to actively avoid the whole small talky stuff so then through kind of having that experience I started doing it a little bit more on this trip that's good I thought it was nice yeah but look we've been through this we've been through the whole talking about something versus talking about nothing thing and how talking about nothing is actually really meaningful and valuable like why do you still have this bias against it um like it's not about it's not about what you're saying it's just about the it, fact that you're saying <laughs> uh yeah it's to use the terminology from uh some of the stuff i've been reading from transaction analysis it's about stroking the other person <laughs> <laughs> really stroking it's the a other stroke person. yeah that's all it is what do you mean by stroking the other person uh you know it's a it's a bit <laughs> no it's not a bit it's a stroke it is a stroke uh you know you're just you're you're telling the other person that you know i see you i appreciate you i accept you you know okay i clearly that's haven't been saying. reading enough of the stuff that you have because that sort of thing hasn't quite seeped into my subconscious yet whereas for years it's been sort of all these books that you read about charisma and stuff is all about avoiding small talk at all costs and progressing the conversation to something more interesting oh i have to be interesting <laughs> yeah no exactly <laughs> Nah, I'm not into that, mate. No, fair enough. I'll, t- I'll take your point. Yeah. I'll experiment more with try- trying to be warm. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, no, this is something that I've thought about as well. But like, you know, occasionally you'll find yourself in a situation where you go on like a group holiday with a, with a, with a bunch of people. Hmm. Um, or even like, yeah, I guess it's it's not even limited to group holidays, but like you'll, you'll, do, a, you'll do some kind of event. You'll do a sesh. You'll, you'll have a sesh with a group of people. And it might not necessarily, you know, in, in your sort of normal lives outside of the sesh, it might be actually quite difficult for the group to get together or whatever right and so i always think like 
it's kind of like yeah how much point is there in these like completely one-off things like it's assuming you never see any of these people again it's like uh i guess it's, it's a fun week or whatever but it's it's very it's kind of like zero measure you know if you don't if, if there's no kind of lasting relationship uh, or, look, I, I don't actually think it's zero measure but like is there no. some kind of do you yeah do you think it's in a good place if you never see each other again or do you think like th this has sowed some seeds of, of a, a lasting relationship that you might want to nurture hmm like what's the point if you never see them again i think there is a point but what yeah. is the point no i think there is a point as well it's 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 sort of like friend friends at university that you're like really close to for like a, a short period of time like let's say three years or even one one or two years and then literally after university you never see them again does that mean that the three years that you spent together were kind of pointless in a way i don't think it does i think there is value in these i think there is value in the social interaction even if the social interaction doesn't lead to a long-term relationship right yeah 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 no like it's a fun week or whatever yeah. you know I, I mean like what did you guys get up to sounds like a lot of board games kind of thing yeah it was a lot of board games okay. and just like generally chatting in the evenings yeah and also like uh, on a ski trip like by the time the evening rolls around everyone is completely it's, it's so knackered so it feels like everyone has the guards down and you're just sort of chilling yeah, on the yeah, sofa yeah. and like no one really cares too much to try and kind of actively make conversation it's just very it, it, it felt very very natural very comfortable as if it were a group of close friends and we were just kind of chilling yeah and occasionally if something you know needed to be said someone said it and occasionally yeah. we'd play a board game or you know have a brief round of articulate or play some pandemic you know okay yeah so i think even even if i don't see any of them again um it would still have been an, a valuable experience because it was generally fun okay sure um anyway yeah uh what's our what's the topic for the week um i wanted to oh well you said you had a topic so you'll do the topic but i thought yeah. we should touch briefly on uh, the whole coronavirus situation oh um, what's that <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I think this is like, I think it's pretty interesting because it's like my, my whole Twitter feed is just about coronavirus. Same lol. And in a way, it's kind of nice that uh, it's kind of brought everyone together. And I saw a good, I saw a good Twitter thread uh, a couple of yesterday or a couple of days ago, which I think has now been deleted, where someone was saying that um you know the coronavirus is you know obviously bad and everything and you know there's a loss of human life and, and all that kind of stuff is is really bad but that it has given people a sense of meaning in their lives that they didn't really have before in in this sort of uh i guess post post-religious world where you know now even small actions like uh you know washing your hands or using hand sanitizer or like you know doing like small things yeah. are now really meaningful like stockpiling toilet paper and baked beans and uh yeah sure um but yeah they're meaningful because you're doing it for like the community at large because like you know if you're a young person or whatever you're not at that much risk yourself it's more about the the knock-on effects and this is kind of given people a uh, a reason to a reason to be <laughs> to act in service of one another you know and uh and yeah i think the, the, i think the thread was saying and i think the, the first tweet of the thread was something like i'm gonna say this i don't know <laughs> i i think there's a 50 percent chance it's actually harmful to say this <laughs> uh, but i'm gonna say it anyway <laughs> um but i think it was interesting and uh, what was the, there was one sort of crucial bit yeah where it was like yeah to to an extent people want to keep going on about it because like yeah if you look at the twitter feed it's literally only coronavirus tweets you know and he yeah he was basically saying that he thinks like yeah it's bad and everything and there is a, there's plenty to go on about but people also want to go on, mm. on about it because it's, it's this thing, thing that that's brings like, people together yeah exactly uh, i thought that was pretty interesting like the war spirit the blitz yeah 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 exactly so um th this was very much a thing at the airport so um, oh, oh yeah you few, must have yeah yeah so a few hours ago it was uh i landed in geneva airport and um, I actually uh, ran into someone who recognized me from the videos. He was like, oh, hey, Ali, how's it going? I was like, oh, hey, man. Uh, and, and, we, and we had a little chat. And um, instead of shaking hands, he was like, oh, I'm not going to shake your hand, but let's bump, it, uh, bump elbows. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it felt really nice, like just like bumping elbows. It, it felt more nice than a handshake would have done because it was like there was this la meta layer of we're, we're in this together yeah, yeah, type yeah. thing. Comrade. And then after, yeah, the, the, uh, the comradeship, absolutely. And then afterwards, when I was saying goodbye to the squad that I went on the trip with, yeah. we all did foot bumps instead of handshakes or hugs. <laughs> and again, that that felt more meaningful than a hug would have done because i mean I, but because, that's stupid right you've just spent the whole week at a house together if any no, of you have coronavirus you've already all got it no sure but you, you know it, i think i it think was it for was the bands it, or something it was or. it was it was partly for the bands but also partly i think it was more meaningful than a hug would have been because a okay. hug or a handshake at this point is so passe oh, that okay. it's, it's yeah, practically yeah, yeah. required but to take the act I, 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 the added effort to have that you know slight giggle be like oh, yeah. oh <laughs> let's let's foot bump yeah. <laughs> you know, cheeky foot bump and you sorted yeah anyway um the topic that i want to talk about is 
is um, I will uh, I'll set the scene for you. All right. So uh, I'm driving home from work in the car. Okay. I'm listening to have a guess. Tim Ferriss. Yes. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he's interviewing some of some dude. I think it's Josh Wadeskin who you've referenced far too many times in this podcast. <laughs> yeah, that's quite, that's uh, <laughs> pretty lame of me. Yeah, exactly. What do you like, eh? Um, and I th- I think that was the interview, but they were talking about. Uh, Josh Waitzkin. Uh, have you have you heard this episode? Like the most yeah. recent one? Yeah, I, I've at least heard part a lot. So Josh Waitzkin talking about his <clears throat> this uh, near death experience that he had when he like blacked out in a pool in in a, in a swimming pool in New York and was hypoxic. Uh, his okay, brain didn't I get have, hypoxic. I I, 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 his brain didn't get oxygen for a solid four minutes, uh, and all estimates were that he should have died or got severe brain damage. But because he'd been doing all this breath control y kind of stuff, he survived. And he said that after that, he had this real you know it's like it's like what everyone says after they have a near death experience that you know I just felt, uh, I felt the sudden clarity. I really realized that my purpose in life was to try and help my family and my general community as much as I could, blah, blah, blah. Um, and Tim Ferriss's thing was that, yeah, he, he he himself hasn't had a near-death experience like that, but he one, once went on some like writing retreat and one of the exercises they were asked to do was to um, ask to work, well, was to like really write out in detail the answer to the question that if you were, if you knew you were going to die two years from now, um, in perfect health, you know, in whatever health you happen to be in right now, but you just know that in two years time you're going to die, how would you change the way that you're living? And this is something that, like, I think it was the right time of the day because, I, or, or you know, just like uh, if, uh, for the for the first time in ages, I've been listening to a podcast on single speed rather than double speed, oh. and therefore everything just felt a lot more slow and a lot more mellow than it normally does when it's normally a kind of rapid pace. Yeah, um, I think like a few a few different factors combined to, to to make that question like really kind of hit me because it's like a pretty standard thing in the sort of personal development world that you know think about what you want uh, you, you know if you were to die next year, yeah, would you yeah, really? Yeah, it, it, it's pretty classic but because it's so classic and so passe I just hadn't really considered it for a very long time like a matter of years like well, what my answer to that question would be so I happened to kind of be st- stopped at a Starbucks just kind of passing a few hours until until the meeting that I had and so I got out my my little diary thing and I really started kind of thinking about what the answer to this question would be and I kind of arrived at a bit of a blank because I was like I, I'm, I'm actually not sure how much of my life I would change if I knew I was going to die in two years yeah. there were a few things that I, I thought about that I'd probably go to work less often if if, if not at all if at all yeah. Um, I'd probably <laughs> I arrived at the conclusion I'd probably spend more time watching TV shows and playing video games <laughs> yeah nice <laughs> um, I, f- I felt that I'd probably play more sports because squash and badminton is really fun and I'd want to do more of that yeah and then just generally hang out with friends and kind of go around different people's houses and play board games and stuff yeah um, but that felt like a very unsatisfying answer because I felt like I didn't really have a kind of broad life purpose that I was kind of working towards and also that I didn't really have a bucket list of sorts because people say that oh you know I'd want to I'd want to climb Mount Everest I'd want to skydive off of the I don't know Empire State Building or whatever yeah but I didn't really have any of these things going through my mind in the slightest okay and so I want to talk about to what extent this uh you know I will die in x number of years question is worth is worthwhile as a way of figuring out what to do with our lives in the present along with a few other themes that I want to touch on but you know any any provisional thoughts so far provisional thoughts I think my provisional thoughts are that it's quite sensitive to like the time frame because like depending on what projects one is you know pursuing in their lives a time frame of like one month is would be very different from like six months from one year two years five mm. years ten years you know um so for example like the main way i spend my time these days is working on uh causal and two years is quite a short period of time if i knew i was going to die in two years i don't know it's like an it's like an awkward period of time if it was like i knew i'd die in one year in or like something. two weeks or something then yeah yeah that simplifies the question a little yeah bit, if it? it's like five years or something then it's like yeah i can still give causal a good shot if it's like one year then it's like okay i clearly can't if it's two years then it's like ah good good try and do something there <laughs> uh but yeah it's really more of a long you know medium to long term project so t- i think two years is uh i'd have to think about how for example causal would fit into my life if uh if the if the frame was two years but then i think there are a lot of like yeah there are a lot of like s- shorter term projects that i would like to do that i just have kind of fallen by the wayside like i've been meaning to set up an aquarium for quite a few months now i'd like to do that and if i knew i was dying in two years i'd definitely do that um and yeah i think uh i think the thing i'd probably yeah i think the thing i'd probably prioritize is uh is a, is the, the sort of 
profound sense of connection that you get connection to other people that you get when you do certain things and i think watching movies and tv shows is actually one of those things as in like sitting on your laptop watching a tv show yeah sure or yeah. watching a tv show with other people uh i mean either or okay um why wh- why does sitting on your laptop watching a tv show give you a profound sense of connection to other people <laughs> i when i would dude when i watched jojo rabbit like last week i, I rewatched it in the cinema two days later actually. wow thanks for the invite um yeah i think like uh it transports you you know and i think what yeah i think I, yeah i think experiences that transport you is kind of what i mean okay because I would feel I would feel the same way about reading a good fiction book. Okay, sure. Like yeah. a solid Brandon Sanderson two thousand yeah, yeah, word yeah. fantasy novel. Yeah. I would I would like nothing better than to just kind of sit somewhere and just kind of do that. Yeah. <laughs> for like yeah, hours yeah. and hours and hours and end. Yeah. So I think there are a few things where like you know you are sort of transported where in the moment like you're not actually you know your brain isn't actually thinking anymore you're just kind of like doing this thing and I think for example watching a really good movie or TV shows like that I think like having you know having a really good sesh with uh, with your friends is is a bit like that. Oh okay in a way where you get taken out of the yeah the the, the present moment yeah almost. yeah 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 you you sort, in a of, sort uh, of transcendental way sort of yeah it's almost like this is this is not quite the right phrasing but like you lose a sense of self in that moment hmm. and you're you're just kind of like you you're just vibing you're straight yeah, vibing. Was, <laughs> <laughs> that was the phrase that came into my mind and i was like no i cannot say that <laughs> <laughs> that's basically it there you're straight vibing and it's like you know when you're playing like a really good badminton game as well yeah. like you know you're it's not like aware of state. things the flow state it's, it's yeah it's kind of like the flow state yeah like the whole deep deep work thing that you're full full on focused on this thing that like the time just goes and you're like damn yeah that was you're like focused but like not consciously kind of thing you know yeah and but you would yeah. probably describe it as like i think fun would be the wrong word to use to describe that sort of thing even yeah. though even though it is fun yeah um but it's like when you're in the hit in the end in, in like the midst of like a squash rally mm-hmm. the the thought isn't oh this is fun yeah there is no thought there is it's no just, thought it's exactly, just you yeah. the racket the ball yeah <laughs> the other person's head <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> trying to hit their head as hard as you can Okay, so I think I'd prioritize those kinds of things. I wonder if if the t- if the frame were ten years rather than two years, it would it would still be a case of prioritizing those things. And I wonder if it's worth, yeah, because for example, um, I don't watch a lot of TV shows or movies and things, even though I d- I do enjoy it. Um, and n- like a, a few a few weeks ago, I, I had I had a few sessions on on the Switch playing The Witcher. And I, I really enjoyed those. And I felt like I was in a way in this sort of flow state almost. But then all these other things that I should have been doing with my time instead, they always kind of come to the fold and make me enjoy that time less. And most of them seem to be around the whole uh, the whole kind of career in inverted commas, right? Well, creating economic value. Yeah, yeah creating economic value as in a career, basically. Um, because for some reason, I think my, my whole, uh, the sort of the North Star with which I kind of point in terms of what I should be doing at any, any given moment is, okay, how can I secure economic <laughs> value for the future? so that in in said future I don't have to worry about securing economic value which is like a right. very kind of like circular thing almost because like for me one of my biggest fears in life is to kind of be shackled to a job that I don't enjoy <laughs> I think yeah, I've, said, sure. I've said that a few times before and so that seems to be a big part of what I what I do with my time but I also enjoy it yeah it's a different sort of enjoyment than the sort of enjoyment you get from watching a TV show but it is enjoyment nonetheless yeah sure and I wonder to what extent I would do that if the if the time frame were two years I probably wouldn't, wouldn't continue to make YouTube videos if the time frame was two years really yeah oh. Why? Because the YouTube thing is very much just for the money. <laughs> just, yeah, exactly. Uh, just for the views. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's basically just. <laughs> no, because the YouTube we'll thing is very to, much. We'll have to cut that bit out. <laughs> uh, the YouTube thing is very much for like long term value. Okay. It's like I don't actually care about the short term impact of the videos that I make because I the, even even thinking about that is just an impediment to actually doing the thing. Okay. I just care about the long term impact of it. And if there were no long term impact, or if I knew that YouTube as a platform was going to die tomorrow, or yeah. like in two years time, it wouldn't make sense to continue to churn out these videos yeah because at some point i can no longer say that actually the act of making a youtube video is the most fun thing i could be doing with my time at any given moment it's very much a long-term economic value creation type thing yeah so um how do we get onto this oh we were talking about this question of what would your day look like kind of two years from now uh, as like so if you if you were to die two years from now what would you want to do in that time the other thing that i was sort of thinking about on a similar theme is you know this classic deathbed question of you know when you're on your deathbed uh what will you regret doing slash not doing yeah and more often than not people people say when, when you when you're projecting far ahead you would regret more the things that you didn't do rather than the things that you did do um and i wonder to what extent that's also useful as a kind of decision making strategy because again with this whole issue of trying to figure out what to do with my life one of the questions that i'm coming up with is like okay you know when i'm hopefully kind of 80 something 90 something or potentially you know in a few weeks time in an intensive care unit bed on a ventilator <laughs> And I think about what my regrets in life are. What do I not want to be on that list? Is this something that you think about at all? Um, 
Yeah, I guess a little bit. But I mean, not on a regular basis, more at sort of turning points in my life. And yeah, these were some of the thoughts, some of the things I was thinking about when I decided to kind of, you know, leave my job and try and do the whole startup thing and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it was, it was similar things of like, you know, X number of years from now, will I be glad I had a job for a bit longer or something or you know and if i don't do like the startup thing will i regret that and yeah it was it was quite clear that i would Hmm. i think the reason why that type of thinking it doesn't sit well with me 100 percent is because it's sort of like that conundrum you get into when you're like okay well you know live every day as if it were your last which is a bit of a myth really because yeah because of the time scale it really depends on the time scale yeah Yeah. if yeah if it was every day like your last you're like i don't know (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> just watch a lot of tv shows yeah <laughs> yeah so i think for me it's 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 that balance between doing the potentially not 100 percent hedon, hedonistically enjoyable work right now to secure any, any kind of like future versus you know live in the moment bro uh just do the things that you enjoy bro yeah type type vibe and i'm thinking that thinking about that more and more the closer we get to august when i'll be officially quitting the job yeah or rather i'll be uh i'll be unemployed rather than yeah. actively quitting the job you've been asked to leave <laughs> <laughs> yeah politely asked to leave yeah for the record <laughs> show in the door <laughs> <laughs> here is your stuff <laughs> so i don't know man it's just a bit of, so like going back to this podcast episode i just kind of felt a bit melancholy at the time because like giving that question of you know if i were to die in two years time like serious consideration i also kind of felt a bit like maybe i'm not doing this whole game that I, uh, I i felt a bit that maybe i'm not playing this game properly if i didn't have a bucket list of things why i don't know it, it, it just seems like you're supposed to have a bucket list and I, I suppose if i would have a bucket list like on that bucket list would be i want to busk on the london underground at some point <laughs> but you okay, know, right. that's a fair it's it's not anything grandiose whereas I don't know. I always feel like bucket list type stuff is, I don't know. It just seems a bit like hollow. Mm. Like I want to see the Eiffel Tower before I die. <laughs> yeah. Stuff like that. Or like maybe, uh, maybe just personally, I don't appreciate those kinds of things that much. I think like novel sensory experiences is quite good. So like, you know, the scuba diving thing that I've recently gone into, that's, that's quite cool. I do want, I would probably want to try skydiving. Yeah. I think like novel sensory experiences are quite a special thing. Okay. But yeah. bucket list wise. Yeah. I guess that's what people try and do on bucket list, right? You try and have some novel sensory experience. I want to try LSD at some point before I die. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, why do you, why do you, I mean, you always have a go at people for like living the deferred life plan or something. Yeah. It seems like you're basically just doing that, except the thing that, yeah, the thing that you sort of do to pass the time is maybe, maybe you enjoy a bit more than most people enjoy their part, their deferred life plan pastime. And like, like, can you elaborate your thinking on this? Because I vaguely know what you're talking about, but a lot of the listeners won't follow okay. you. Basically, you always rail against people who have this mindset of like, oh, I'm just going to do this particular okay. thing. Firstly, I don't rail against those people. People can live life however they want, <laughs> <laughs> for the record. Uh, okay, sure. Um, but, you know, okay, fine. There is this concept of the deferred life plan, Thank which you. you occasionally mention. <laughs> <laughs> fine. Uh, where, you know, people might be doing something like, for example, having a job that they dislike uh, and their mind mindset is that oh, i'll just do this for a few years uh until some you know point after which then i'll be able to like do what i really want and be happy and all this kind of stuff yeah. and you kind of rail against that sure. but it seems like this y- yeah your compass seems very strongly calibrated towards creating economic value yep. um which is actually exactly what a lot of people's deferred life compasses is calibrated towards of like oh yeah i'll just stay in this like really high paying sort of finance job that i don't really like and i don't really get to see my friends very much but like it's just for a few years until i have enough money and then i can chill out for a bit so if it feels like your compass is calibrated in the same way you happen to be doing something that maybe you enjoy more than these than some other people who have the similar you know compass and and plan like i don't know you probably enjoy youtube videos more than uh someone who uh you know works at an investment bank enjoys being there at like 3 a.m on a on a thursday evening or something um but it feels like sort of the same thing just like a slightly different scale so like in principle and yeah like the fact that you say that you actually don't enjoy you know it's this whole thing of like i must create economic value this like stops you from being able to enjoy just playing some video games for a bit or just like doing whatever that feels kind of off to me so it feels like in principle you have it's the same it's the same mindset as as perhaps a mindset that you you might sort of not want but you're kind of doing it what do you think um i disagree 
And the reason I disagree is that, firstly, I don't rail against the deferred life plan as such. I mean, I think it's 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 perfectly reasonable to say, okay, I'm I'm in this high high paying city job, and I'll be and I'll do it for one, two, or three years for a, a short enough amount of time, um, so that I can build up this economic sur- surplus, so that then it affords me the freedom to do more of the things that I might actually want to do without worrying so much about the economic side of things. Okay. Later on in life, I think I th- I, th- I think that's perfectly reasonable. Okay. Um, it's probably not the way I w- I would personally personally choose to do it assuming i did i actively disliked what i was doing okay but if you know we we've, we've got a few friends who are lawyers and stuff who are on like stupidly high salaries but seem to actually enjoy what they're doing as well yeah and that's you know completely reasonable um even though if you were to ask them you know if you were to die two years from now would you would you go to work they're probably like hell no yeah. like they're still enjoying what they're doing but yeah. it wouldn't be on their kind of two-year life plan bucket list of things to do like i would go into the office right and i think it's sort of the same for me in that uh Perhaps sort of the same for me in, in in that I do enjoy it. It is really fun. It's not the sort of fun that I would do if I had a two year a two year time window, but it is probably the sort of fun I would do if I had a ten year time window. Yeah. So it sort of fits in the middle of that. Plus, for me, there's also this extra thing of, and I, I guess it's the same for a lot of people, which is that you know, unless you are completely um, opting out of the career, i.e., economic engine game. Yeah. Unless you unless you're completely opting out of that, you do need a way to drive your economic engine yeah, throughout the sure. rest of your life. For sure, for sure. And for some people, that might be kind of earning an absolute ton of money right now, so then they can work as a barista in Argentina or something for the rest of the time. You know, to just use a, a simple example. Or it might be sort of more for me. It's to you know this classic thing of generating these different these different streams of revenue that can kind of be maintained over time. Yeah. Because then that is the economic engine sorted, and then I can you know yeah have the rest of the time to kind of play video games. And I'm perfectly happy in the moment while I'm still young to defer playing video games yeah. because I know that video games were not would not be like not playing more video games is, is not something I'm going to regret really. okay, right. it's not like part of the long term long term strat but if I were to die kind of like next week or next month or something then doing more he- hedonistic pleasures like playing more video games would be on my list okay sure do you get where I'm coming from yeah I guess uh, yeah I guess the deferred life plan is just quite is a uh, extreme case of yeah I think the thing about look everyone needs everyone needs the you know to sort out the economic engine I think that's that's just true unless, you know, unless you're willing to well yeah unless you're basically willing to opt out of society or you happen to have just been handed a nice house uh at birth and you don't have uh you don't have to sort of work for a, a roof on your head and food on the table everyone needs to sort out the economic engine and yeah there's lots of ways to do that and you know all of them you know, a lot of them are fairly reasonable uh yeah i think that kind of solves it because yeah it's like yeah, i'm, I'm sorting out an economic that. engine in like a way that is okay. that is fun and that has hopefully lasting lasting value that's not directly tied to the, the time that i'm putting in yeah it. yeah whereas our friend working at a law firm is sorting out their economic engine but it is directly tied to the amount of time that they're working yeah sure hmm. the other thing I, f- I find myself doing a lot is um i, th- I think i might have mentioned this on a previous episode is in a way i'm defer life i'm <laughs> deferred life planning for the next for un, un, until like four months from now when i'll when i'll have quit the job yeah like i find myself saying a lot to, to a lot of people or and and to myself more often that oh you know uh come august then i'll be able to do this thing or you know oh, i'm yeah. gonna start guitar lessons from august i'm gonna start piano lessons from august i'm gonna start doing ice skating from august yeah because it feels like august isn't this time where i'll suddenly have this kind of surplus of spare time and i'll be able to kind of do the things that i want to do yeah whereas every time i say that i sort of it sort of feels a bit off because i i think that you know if i actually you know i actually could start guitar lessons from today rather than for from four months from now yeah but i think there is an element of there like a genuinely being a restriction on my time yeah at, sure at the moment and yeah i'm not quite sure how to think about those sorts of things yeah i mean i think most life isn't like a fully continuous thing there are always going to be like discrete points in time when things change and stuff and so like i think yeah i think there's like a there's a bad sort of mental model slash framework which is that you know if you are doing if you are truly living life correctly then you wouldn't change anything day to day ever or anything like that because life is this fully continuous thing Mm. where like do you know what i mean by continuous here uh sort of but do elaborate yeah this like fully fully continuous thing where like uh you know day every every day should almost like just be the same yeah like like, doing exactly what you want there are no kind of like seasons in life yeah there's no like seasons there's no like yeah discrete points but it it doesn't really work that way right so i do think it's reasonable to 
have discrete points. I think seasons is actually quite nice, a nice way to think about things. Yeah, I came across that framing of it a few, I think like last year sometime, sometime, it was about the different seasons of life and how there's no such thing as having a life that's totally in balance with like your work life, your family life, your hobbies, your friends, blah, blah, blah. But actually you can think of it as different seasons. Yeah. Like early on in your career, it, it, it would be reasonable to prioritize work rather than, I don't know, friends, for example. And later on in your career, it might, it might be, you know, as, as the seasons change, you prioritize family a bit more and, and so on. Yeah. I think I heard on the, I heard on the, on the, on Conan's podcast, uh, he mentions that I think like, I don't know, something like Da Vinci or something said that like everyone should like completely change their career when they hit 40 or something so that you almost have these like two, two completely different seasons or whatever. Uh, and I thought, I thought that was pretty cool because, um, yeah, I've, I've kind of always imagined doing something like that where, you know, I'd be very happy to sort of do this whole startup thing for the next like 10 years or something. Um, but then I quite like to, you know, make movies and that kind of thing, you know? So I think like having just this one thing that you do for your whole life is kind of weird. And mm. I, yeah, it, it seems worth thinking about of like, hmm, maybe I can like spend 10 years doing, you know, you could have like five or six productive 10 year chunks of doing completely different things, which would probably be very fulfilling and, and interesting. Yeah, I think so. And I, I will, I was sort of thinking about this on on this trip like you've probably heard the general uh, vibe that time slows down when you do novel things yeah and like uh, I really know I really found that to be true like this week of skiing like it was really fun but it didn't it didn't feel like time was flying whereas for example a standard week at work I couldn't tell you what happened last week at work for example because it was exactly the same as every other week at work has been yeah, yeah. and it's like you start on Monday and you get to the end of the week you're like oh okay yeah. cool like where did that time go it feels like it just passed in the blink of an eye yeah um, whereas on the ski because it was such a novel sensory and motor experience yeah. um, things felt a lot more slow mm. and so that's kind of got me thinking about this whole idea of kind of change changing up the things that we do with different seasons i was uh, i was speaking to one of the anesthetists at my hospital about sort of this a few weeks ago um he's like in his 50s um so he's a consultant anesthetist he's been doing that for like kind of 15 20 years now yeah <clears throat> and i asked him because we seem to be having a good rapport i asked him my standard question of you know if you won the lottery would you still do what you're doing or if yeah. you won the lottery would you still be an anesthetist yeah and his way of answering that was that well I mean, probably not, but he said that you have to keep in mind that I'm like in my 50s now and I've been doing this for 20 years. Yeah. So if I were to win the lottery and in a way he's implying he'd, if, if, if he would not need the economic engine, he would be interested in, in finding a new challenge. Okay, yeah. Um, and I thought that was a very nice way of answering that question because other people that I've heard answer it would just e either say I would go completely part time or I would leave medicine altogether. Yeah. Whereas he was saying I would leave medicine, but not because I don't like it, just more because I want another challenge in my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's kind of a good way, good way of looking at it. Uh, there's a good quote that I'm trying to find right now. Uh, have you have you read Poor Charlie's Almanac? No, I haven't. It's been on my Must have heard list. Of, it. of course, I've heard of it. Yeah. yeah so <laughs> this is like a, a compilation of various things about Charlie Munger's life. Charlie Munger is uh, Warren Buffett's sort of business partner. Um, and there's a quote, there was a quote at the start of it by like Ben Franklin or something about prolonging your life. And it was really good. And I'm trying to find it because I won't be able to do it justice. This is now a coffee table book at our flat in London. Oh, poor Charlie's Almanac. <laughs> exactly. Wow. <laughs> We've got that. We've got uh, Capital by Thomas Piketty, which <laughs> I haven't opened. <laughs> We've got the table tennis table. <laughs> You're really living that stereotypical startup life, aren't you? Oh, what was the quote? When's Principles by Ray Dalio going to feature on the list? Nah, never, mate. Never. Okay, anyway, the quote was basically something along the lines of writing stuff down basically lets you live sort of two lifetimes in one. Because, you know, for example, you just said that like last week and you you have no idea what happened at work last week. If you sort of write down what happened at work last week, for example, in like a daily journal or whatever, like, yeah, writing these things down and reflecting on them it will basically let you live two, two whole lives in one. It lets you like, yeah, do you know what I mean? All right, I'm sold. I'm going to start restart the daily journal. <laughs> <laughs> well, it takes a single quote. Yeah. All right. Well, this PDF isn't loading, but yeah. But um, so on a similar theme, like on Thursday, so a few days ago, I had a ski lesson with this guy called Rupert. Okay. Um, um, and Rupert had very successfully, it seemed, opted out of the standard life script. Okay. Because he was like, yeah, so he he left school probably at like 18, given how old he is. He's, he's, he was 26 now. And I was quite yeah. surprised because he seemed as if he was a lot older. older. Yeah. But I guess when someone's your ski instructor and they're a pro, you just assume they're older. Yeah. Um, he was 26, 26 and he'd done 14 ski seasons in a row. So he would like do France for five months of the year, then go to Bali for two months and then go to Australia for the other five months of the year while it's their winter. Yeah, and then just kind of basically repeat this process. And he's got his instructor qualification, and now he he you know like back in the day he used to work at like the you know Alpine Burger Shop to pay 
for his ski pass and his accommodation and things. But now he's so pro an instructor that he just instructs and that funds his lifestyle. And he was saying that, yeah, his, 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 his thing was that, yeah, you know, um, cause I, I kind of asked him, uh, in a sort of non rude way that, so have you like, are you going to do this forever or are you going to get a real job at some point kind of thing? Right. And his, his, his thing was that, you know, I'm, I'm making 55 euros an hour doing this thing. Uh, I really enjoy it. So w why would I change anything? And he said, I suppose at some point I might like to start my own ski school, but you know, that's a few years down the line at least. Yeah. And in the meantime, y'all just continue doing ski seasons everywhere around the world. He's got his girlfriend who travels with him. And it just seems like a, an interesting sort of lifestyle of that like and in like uh, like anytime i go skiing i always kind of look at the the clique of ski instructors and kind of think oh that would be a cool group to kind of be part of you yeah. know when they're all kind of hanging out in their red jackets yeah and, yeah yeah and matching kit and like laughing in french yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oui, oui, oui. um yeah so it's just sort of it's sort of sort of like that idea that we, we talk about about expanding your box and how travel expands your box <laughs> right and so i felt that my box had been expanded to the possibility of this sort of lifestyle okay and just like even though i probably wouldn't want it for myself the fact that someone else is doing something so seemingly rogue yeah makes me feel a lot less uh bad about kind of taking a career break and like you know wanting to go to japan for a bit and wanting to travel the world for a bit hmm. yeah that's cool yeah i think like you do sometimes come across people who do seem to have like one thing that they just care about so much that they they kind of already set that like i'd actually like to do this for the rest of my life like i find some of my friends are now like pilots and things do you have any friends who end up becoming pilots no it seems like that's that's a whole like culture where like i don't know from like a really young age some kids are just really into planes and they just really want to be a pilot and they love everything about it and um yeah it seems like that that's the kind of thing where like if they won the lottery they'd still they'd still be they still fly planes <laughs> like they're just really into it and then yeah you get some people who have that with certain sports like skiing and, and things like that um and yeah i always find that interesting because i never had like one thing that was like yeah i, I would i would love to dedicate my entire life to this thing whereas mm -hmm. some people do have that thing it sounds like skiing might be that thing for for rupert or rupert no no he, no, he was a, he was a brit ah. <laughs> all right basically Rup, everyone Rup. Every, everyone in this french ski resort was a brit like we did not hear a single french accent in oh, okay week. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of geezers <laughs> a lot of geezers exactly um yeah but yeah, i always find that interesting but i mean i think it's easy to romantic i think it is it is easy and dangerous to romant i mean it's, it sounds like rupert's having a good time but it's easy and dangerous to romanticize that kind of lifestyle oh true yeah because like you know when i was in hawaii for example a few months ago we were doing some like uh you know snorkeling scuba diving that kind of stuff and you know i was chatting to like some of the instructors and about you know what it's like and yeah, some of them had basically you know, moved to Hawaii. You know, they're really into like diving and things. And they had moved to Hawaii right off university or something um, to just kind of, yeah, on, 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 yeah. If you looked at a picture of their life, it would look very idyllic. You know, you kind of do this sort of gorgeous sort of scuba diving, instructing, uh, really nice weather in Hawaii, all this kind of stuff. Just, uh, you know, living a super chill life where you, you sort of ostensibly get to do the things that you enjoy doing all the time. Um, but he was kind of saying that, ah, you know, I've kind of been doing this for a few years. And and you know it's not that much money i have like uh i have like a wife we're planning to have a kid uh i'm actually doing an online course in cybersecurity, and i'm trying to get like a tech job in, in texas <laughs> wow. so i can earn some more money and kind of uh you know provide for my family that kind of thing so i think it's like yeah it's about like a sustainable economic engine yeah although with that guy i, w I wonder if, if he'd won the lottery and therefore had his economic engine sorted would the diving thing continue oh to be quite his? possibly yeah yeah but yeah, you're right. I think it's like s sustainable economic engine definitely has to be part of the part of the formula in some in some way. Yeah, yeah, and you've got to sort of account uh, account for the the variance in your own priorities. Because like when you're like 21 years old or whatever, yeah, you can you can you can do anything basically. You don't really, yeah, you know, generally you won't have any responsibilities. You don't really care about many things apart from I guess like having fun or whatever. Um, but then the danger is if you do that for too long, then when you're slightly older and if your priorities slightly change, then you might regret not sorting out the economic engine in a slightly more sustainable way or something yeah i think that's a good way of looking at it so that's sort of been yeah. i've kind of been asking myself this question a lot over the last kind of six months about do i really want to kind of stay doing medicine and the answer has always been that yeah sort of in in a sense because i know that when i'm 45 for example then it would be a really good backup option to just being able to be a doctor because it's just it's, it's just kind of quite fun especially if you're not doing it full time yeah um whereas if i were to completely opt out of that and then that option becomes closed off to me yeah at that point when i'm 45 then i don't know it would it would seem weird to still kind of rely on youtube or rely on whatever as as like the economic engine hmm. so i think it's nice to have the option of doing that the other thought that just kind of sparked is um uh, another thing i've been i've been thinking about is um as, as we've talked about a few times going to america to potentially do a master's which you're not a fan of no 
um this uh this guy that I'm, I'm friends with who i went on the ski trip with actually he's he's also not a fan of this of, of this plan his uh, th- the way he phrased it was that i'm falling into the fallacy of thinking right um i need to do something this is something yes <laughs> therefore, yeah, therefore yeah. i will do it exactly <laughs> yeah, yeah i was like oh damn <laughs> when he put it that way <laughs> that's good um, and then uh, alongside that, there was I, th- I think there was that tweet you sent me a few a few days ago, which was someone tweeting, you know, the best thing about having a master's is that the thought of I should go get a master's just never crosses my mind. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's so good. Because <laughs> it just seems like such a kind of standard thing, you know, I don't know what to do in my life. Oh, you know, maybe I should do a master's. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've been really reconsidering whether that's actually what I want to do with my life. Congratulations. <laughs> I Thank told you, you this month ago. <laughs> Well, you know how to say it takes seven repetitions or something for, a, for yeah, an idea yeah, to, yeah. To, to fully sink in, etc. Yeah, it takes eight follow-up emails to, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. to respond to you. Yeah. Um, the, uh, on, a, on a related vein, the, the other thing associated with going to America is, for example, if I were to do my medical training or like residency in America, that would yeah. be sort of, that's three or four years of like fairly intense where, um, from what people tell me, it's like, you're lucky if you have one weekend off every month because you're working most weekends and, and all that all, all that sort of stuff. Yep. But I wonder if that would be kind of fun given that it's sort of a short burst of a very different sort of dynamic to what I'm I'm used to. Yeah. And therefore that would add more variety and novelty and stuff to my life, which would therefore be interesting. Um, I've been thinking about that, like after doing this year or two or three of just kind of aimlessly traveling around. Yeah, possibly. So have we come to any conclusions? I think your point about the time frame of the kind of when you will die question is really important. Yep. I think when, whenever we're deciding what to do with our lives, we, we do need to have a sustainable economic engine. Yeah, I think this economic engine metaphor is really good. And you, you, know, you can extend it in different ways. Where like like in board know. games as well, like economic Sorry? engine. Like if you play that, yeah, yeah. Like, like, like a farm board yeah, game yeah, or like yeah, a yeah. building civilization. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you got a sheep engine or a wood engine or a wheat engine? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think it's good in, in, in the economic sense because like you can extend the metaphor slightly further of like, okay, is my engine a, uh, is my engine run on fossil fuels that requires me <laughs> to like destroy the, destroy the planet to, to like get this stuff out to burn it? Or is it like, you know, maybe a bit more renewable where all I need is sunlight, which is always present, um, you know, that kind of thing. And so like, I guess there's the whole passive income kind of stuff or like, you know, sort of semi-passive income is more like a, a renewable source, like like wind where, you know, it's there most of the time if you're on a, if you're in the middle of the sea or something or like solar <laughs> where it's like, it's there most of the time. Uh, but it's not like fossil fuels where, where you're yeah, where, trading your time. Yeah, where fossil fuels is like, you know, you're, you're getting like a ton of energy really quickly, but like it's not extremely sustainable kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I think that's a nice metaphor actually. Cool. I think that's a good place to end it. Have we got any, have we got any insights of the week? I think I do actually. Let me just uh, pull up my Kindle highlights. Oh, you've got Kindle highlights now. It's normally, you know, uh, let me just pull up my, my recent tweets. <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't done, I haven't done many tweets recently. I've had a couple of drafts which are coronavirus jokes that I think would be insensitive to post publicly. Oh, mate, I've been thinking about doing a reacting to coronavirus memes, but <laughs> the other two the, the, the other two people Don't on my it. team, Don't like the, the editor and the content guy, were like, no, this is in bad taste. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's in bad taste. Um, are you going to read out your coronavirus jokes? That are, no, not, no, I won't. Why not? I think the, they're actually really good tweets. I think, at least look, one I, I think they're good, but for, look, from what I've seen, I've studied, um, I've been studying this over the past few days. I think it's insensitive to directly kind of joke about yeah you you don't want the joke to be too directly related to people dying that's kind of not cool you can joke about first or second order you know second order effects of it so i've been seeing lots of puns and jokes about social distancing you know and i'm I'm sure that i haven't actually seen this specific one but i've been trying to think like of of a good phrasing for a joke where it's basically like oh my my crush has been on the social distancing thing for ages (laughs) (laughs) something like that yeah you know people you can joke about like like yeah, you know, some, something about like hoarding toilet paper, that kind of stuff. Whereas like more directly joking about like you know a, a country having an outbreak of it now is is like uh, yeah probably in poor taste. But I swear, like for example, your Swedish currency joke. Hey, <laughs> yeah, that's that uh, that's a very kind of like second order joke. It's not that you're making fun of people dying. No, I'm no, I'm not making. All right, look. and like and like even with like the good memes and stuff, they're not making fun of people dying. They're not. You're right. But f- no, for look, the thing is right. For example. Okay, I will. I will read out my my tweet draft. Okay, let's let's have as it. As a <laughs> this is a a scholarly pursuit of <laughs> sure, yeah, no, not, yeah. For, for science. Only. I will read this out so that we can analyze why this. Okay, you know, no, sure. I, I I will not post this, and I haven't fine. posted it. <laughs> <laughs> so someone's going to listen to this and steal it and post it themselves. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Uh, basically, there's um. Okay, the the, the tweet is. 
Swedish people be talking about COVID-19 while their currency is down 3% against the euro. You're worried about the wrong krona, bro. <laughs> <laughs> so krona is the currency in sweden corona is you know the virus whatever this is like a, it's a standard format where it's like you know x x people be concerning themselves with y thing when z thing is going on and then there's some pun you can make between y and z that you then say you're worried about the wrong thing bro <laughs> so like so that's the joke I don't, I, why do you think posting that is bad i think i think it's completely fine but i wonder if my own compass for this is non-calibrated um like i do not see a single thing wrong with posting that tweet apart, from the, fact that, apart these, from the fact that it's covid it's got covid19 in the subject i th i think your compass with these things is actually terrible okay. <laughs> um i think the reason is because it's kind of like yeah i guess it's it's just a bit direct you know like no but it's 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 clearly it, no no look i'm it's obviously clearly not you're, laughing yeah, about people dying no That's and obviously not what's going on and you're obviously playing into this meme format i uh, like yeah. in a way the the humor of this joke is the fact that you've played into the meme yeah format, it's like as opposed really to really forcing Apart, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Your <laughs> currency is down three percent again, <laughs> and it's the forced nature of that pun which makes it funny, as opposed to the fact that it's actually about COVID. -19. Yes, but for example, if you know, yeah, I don't know. I guess there's, you know, it's like someone in Sweden might read that and think, oh, actually, we're all really worried. You know, the currency is down three <laughs> percent. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> <laughs> How do I do it? <laughs> oh man! No, you know, someone. So, for example, just as an example, someone in Sweden, you know, some well, some of their family members might be affected by the recent outbreak or something, and it's kind of like, oh, actually, my my grand just died of that in Sweden, mate. You know, so it, it's like. Yeah, I think like it would be different if it was like joking about social distancing or like, yeah, just like so it's like a bit too close to the actual. You are actually joking about the Swedish outbreak of COVID-19. That's the joke is about that, even though obviously that's not, you know, that's, that's not, not why it's a hilarious tweet. <laughs> <laughs> if you say so. Um, so, yeah, I think like I'd stay away from. Yeah, you want to you want to joke about the second order effects. OK, so your your model for this is there is one sort of person in the world who would read this and could potentially be offended by their no 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 so look that's that's always going to be the case yeah you know if you joke so, about if you have a joke in which like someone robs a bank yeah you know like you know, you're gonna find there's gonna be people where it's like oh shit my my dad was killed in a bank robbery mate yeah. what, what are you joking about um that's not what's going on here okay why not because i a i think like you know tweeting about yeah i i think be, because of this this reason this reason of like there's always going to be someone who might have like a negative experience related to your joke it it, it depends entirely on like like the audience, right? The, like, you know, making a joke publicly on Twitter with the vast number of followers that I have is very different from me making the exact same joke in like a stand-up comedy special. Uh, no, I was going to say in the group chat with us friends from school. You know, it's like it's completely different. You know, and like when you're making the more public the forum is, the the more chance there is that there will be people who take offense. Uh, yeah, sure, take offense. Um. And so it's worth, I think, being kind of mindful of that. So, for example, you wouldn't make a joke about bank robbery? I would. Okay. So in, in your mind, kind of small subset of people who would be offended because their dad died, died in a bank robbery, that that's fine. But potentially yeah. larger subset of people that would be offended because COVID-19 is actually ravaging their country is, is not fine. At the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perhaps yeah. in a few months' time. Yeah, <laughs> it requires a bit of sensitivity. Once we've got a cure or something, at that point, it, that it's funnier to post that joke. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I think it requires a bit of sensitivity. Okay. So you think I shouldn't make a video reacting to coronavirus memes? No. No, I don't think you should. And you're saying it's because of the kind of the temporal sensitivity. Yeah. Whereas, for example, posting a video reacting to normal memes, even though they are making fun of doctor, patient, blah, 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 everything. Yeah. It's fine because, it's, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just banter. Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay. Interesting. So have we actually got any insights of the week? Um... Apart from the fact that I'm a terrible person and you are very sensitive. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's the main takeaway from this yeah. podcast, I think. How do I just see all my highlights? Your Kindle highlights? Yeah. You can't see them all in one place unless you go on Readwise or unless you sync them to Evernote. That's lame. Oh, I've got one. Um, <clears throat> this was from a dude called Nat Eliason, who is a blog that I follow on, on the internet. And he also has a nice Twitter account. Yeah. He's got this. It, it, it was his like 28th birthday or something recently. Um, <coughs> and so he every year he does these like annual reviews of his, his life. Yeah. And there was 
well, something he said. He said that um, his 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 biggest lesson from this year was is about the importance of building a community. Oh. So he says um, hosting big events is great, but so is investing in building a more casual local community, one where you don't necessarily have to host anything, where you spontaneously end up spending time with people. When people say how much they miss college, I suspect this is a big part of it. Once you graduate college, it's much harder to walk into your friend's home and plop on their couch. Yeah. In the real world, you typically have to schedule get-togethers with anyone you don't work with or see at a third place like the gym. But there are ways you can hack it. One of the best life improvements last year has been to have more standing events. Easy, repeatable, fun things to do with groups of people that you can do on the same day every week or two. A few friends and I have been swimming in Barton Springs, a local natural spring in Austin, early in the morning most Tuesdays since last spring. Even when it was nearly one of the coldest days of the year. We'd freeze our asses off and then go get coffee and bone broth at picnic. It takes almost no planning. We all love it and it works whether three or ten people show up. Other ways are having a spot of brunch. Uh, <coughs> other ways are having a spot a, br- a bunch of friends are members of like the Ocean Lab. So you can do a sauna and ice bath, blah, blah, blah. Or go to the local coffee shop um, every every weekend morning. Uh, so uh, so he, he, he goes on to say that he's, he's recently opened a cafe. Um, and that's been one of the nicest things because it's just like a nice place where people just go and hang out randomly. He says that finding these little ways to increase serendipitous time together or super easy to plan get togethers has probably been one of the biggest sources of happiness the last year. I'm really grateful Austin makes it so easy so well done austin uh, whoever you are um <laughs> nice <laughs> thank you um yeah so i thought that was interesting that is nice I yeah i highlighted that highlighted that in the article that's that we've what we've talked about yeah talked about many a time on this yeah podcast but i haven't really done how, how, how much of this stuff are you doing now that you've got a place in london yeah i feel like we do have a bit of a community thing going on so it's it's, it's kind of turned into a little incubator slash co-working space where uh as one of my friends miran recently left his job to start his own thing and he works out of our our place most days during the week uh um, my friend Mac, his his uh, office just like closed down for coronavirus, and everyone has to work remotely. So he walks he, up to your place. So from, ne- from next week, yeah, we're, we're all gonna like self quarantine together. <laughs> nice. Um, so yeah, it's turning into a little like co-working space, which is quite nice, I think. That's good. And yeah, there's almost always someone over. Like I, I, I don't remember the last day when we didn't have someone over, for example. That's quite nice. Um, That's almost like the university vibe all over again. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of like that. Cool. Um, right, I think we should I think we should end it there. This is quite a long one. All right. Well, thank you everyone for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. That's it for this week. Thank you for listening. If you like this episode, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or on the Apple Podcasts website if you're not using an iPhone. There's a link in the show notes. If you've got any thoughts on this episode or any ideas for new podcast topics we'd love to get an audio message from you with your conundrum question or just anything that we could discuss yeah if you're up for having your voice played on the podcast and your question being the springboard for our discussion email us an audio file mp3 or voice note to hi at notoverthinking.com. if you've got thoughts but you'd rather not have your voice played publicly that's fine as well tweet or dm us at n overthinking on twitter please thanks again for listening and we'll see you next time